The Liberal government is moving to make a major change to the military justice system, as the government intends to remove the military's jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute sexual offenses committed in Canada. As part of a suite of amendments introduced today by Defence Minister Bill Blair, and it would fulfil one of the key recommendations made by former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour. If the amendments pass, criminal code sexual offenses committed in Canada will be investigated and prosecuted in the civilian justice system. Bill Blair is the Minister of National Defense. He joins me now from the foyer of the House of Commons. Minister Blair, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, David. Thanks for having me. Uh, the recommendations you're moving ahead with today, former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour, she recommended this in 2022, that all sexual offenses be investigated and prosecuted exclusively in the civilian justice system. What were the issues? Why did it take nearly two years to get to this point of legislative change? Uh, th thank you, David. And, and even in, in Madam Justice Arbour's report that she did issue in 2022, she indicated that she recognized that, that these changes were, were going to take several years to implement. We've been working apace on, on all of her recommendations. I think we've made some very significant progress. But as Madam Justice Arbour acknowledged herself, it, it did require that we consult broadly with members of the Canadian Armed Forces, with, with particularly victims and survivors of, of sexual assault, and with a number of different advocacy groups and stakeholders. That work has continued. As a matter of fact, uh, Major General, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant General Carignan from the Canadian Armed Forces indicates that they've, they've consulted with over 16,000 uh, members of the Canadian Armed Forces and stakeholders on this issue as well. Uh, we've been working very closely with the leadership of, 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 of CAF and with the Judge Advocate General and with Solicitor Generals and Attorney Generals from across Canada to make sure that we were ready for this change. The introduction of legislation today is the culmination of a great deal of work that has taken, was taken on by my predecessor and, and her team by the Department of National D Defense and, and the Canadian Armed Forces. And we've had a lot of support from stakeholders and, and, and listened, I think. And, I, and, I, and one of the messages I really wanted to convey today, we've heard from those survivors. We're responding to their concerns, and, and I'm very pleased with the legislation we introduced today. You mentioned uh, in the list of people you spoke with were solicitors general and attorneys general at, at the provincial level, because one of the concerns is downloading this will stress out an already overstressed uh, legal system uh, at the provincial level across Canada. So what assurances, measures, and money uh, are you going to provide for the uh, provincial systems to be able to handle some of these cases? Yeah, no, to be very clear, though, David, the, the, the civilian policing system in Canada and the civilian criminal justice system, we're not talking about tens of thousands of cases. In fact, we're talking about hundreds of cases. And in many, most jurisdictions across the country, uh, the police of jurisdiction and those criminal, the criminal justice systems are quite ably uh, going to be able to, to deal with these cases and to prosecute them successfully. But we also recognize in, that some of our military bases are in smaller communities. And so we've been working with the Solicitor Generals and, and the Attorney Generals here in Ontario, for example. Uh, we've been working with the Solicitor and Mr. Mr. Kirchner. Uh, we've entered into a memorandum of understanding on how the federal government, the Canadian Armed Forces, will support uh, civilian policing and civilian prosecutions because we, we all have a responsibility. It's a shared responsibility between our, our government, the Canadian Armed Forces, and the civilian police and, and, and the civilian prosecutors to make sure that these cases are handled in an appropriate way, right. that victims receive the support, respect, and the, and the, and the services that they require. Um, our, our pursuit of justice for them and as well to make sure that they have the, the, the victim support services and, and help that they need to recover from these experiences is critically important. Uh, it, it, it's very much a shared responsibility, and I'm very confident. I, you know, I come from the civilian policing uh, world he, here in Canada, and, and I'm very confident um, they, they have the expertise, the resources right. to do what is required. Th this is also part of, uh, you know, seeking justice uh, for, for the victims here and the survivors here, but also cleaning up the cultural challenges in, inside the Canadian Armed Forces. You, you recently talked about the recruitment challenges and talked about the death spiral the forces were facing with more people leaving that are coming in. What's your runway to reverse that, do you think? I, I know these things take time to get in, and, and that limits the ability to completely fix the culture, but what, what's the runway to turn things around for the CAF before it gets too low and it's too unfixable? D David, I, I, I can assure you that, that I, the leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces, and every member of the Canadian Armed Forces feels a strong se sense of urgency. We, we want to make sure, we have a responsibility to make sure that every member of the Canadian Armed Forces, men and women, right across this country, have a su supportive, safe and respectful work environment to work in. 
one of the things that we've heard very clearly is, at, is when issues of sexual harassment and sexual assault do take place in the Canadian Armed Forces that we needed to make some fundamental changes. Some of those changes are done through ministerial directives, changes in policy, and orders that, that come down from, from the top in the Canadian Armed Forces. And some of them required legislative change. Justice Arbour was, was very clear in, in her very strong advice to us that we needed to change the National Defense Act in order to facilitate the important changes in her recommendation five of ensuring that all of these cases would be investigated in the, criminal, in, in the civilian policing system and prosecuted in the civilian justice system. And so with this legislation, we're institutionalizing that change. But, but ch changing a culture actually is a, it's a process, not an event. There has been an enormous amount of work done over the past several years within the Canadian Armed Forces to address that cultural change. I want to assure every man and woman who serves in the Canadian Armed Forces and every man and woman in Canada who's contemplating the, a future service uh, to their country in the Canadian Armed Forces that we will do everything that's required to make sure that they have a safe, respectable, respectful and supportive work environment. And at the same time, we, we know that we've got a great deal of work to do. We all share that sense of urgency to, to recruit the necessary skills and, and expertise and, and the terrific people that we need in the Canadian Armed Forces to come and work side by side with the people who have already chosen to serve. And we've got to do work to make sure that the work environment for all of them is not only safe and respectful, that, that we provide them with the best training, the best equipment, the best platforms right. to work on, and important missions that can really make that the choice that they make to serve their country a meaningful and important one. Okay, so that intention is very clear. I'm wondering, as Minister of Defense, if you can help us get some clarity sure. on the implications of this motion that your party voted for, that the NDP brought into the House of Commons this week, that some are seeing as a full arms embargo and blocking of all military goods and technology going to Israel, while others, including your government, have suggested it doesn't really fundamentally change how you're operating, just no new military equipment requests will, will, will be sent, uh, will be honored and sent to Israel. What is your understanding as a cabinet minister, as a minister of national defense of what your government has agreed to when it comes to military equipment of any kind going to Israel. Yeah, and, and to be very clear, David, Canada has one of the most robust uh, export uh, permit systems for military equipment, um, and it's, it's operated by, by, by our, our, our global affairs department, but it is, it is a very strong regime. Since January the 8th of this year, well before the, the, the resolution that came before Parliament, the motion that came before Parliament, since January 8th, the, 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 uh, under that existing regime, no uh, new permits of military equipment have been up yet approved by Global Affairs and will not be approved until Global Affairs can be satisfied that each of those permits meets the rigorous standards and requirements of our existing export system. At the same time, all the permits that were issued prior to, to January 8th will continue to be, will proceed with those, they'll continue to be respected. Um, I, would, I would characterize this as a continuation of existing government policy. We are still, up, we haven't changed that very rigorous export re, uh, regime, but we are making sure that all export permits that are approved meet the re rigorous requirements of that system. So it's business as usual, despite the drama and the language and the amendments and the fallout of that vote. Uh, what was the operating procedure the day before this vote? is the operating procedure the days after that's this exactly vote. that's exactly right and, and global affairs as of january the 8th has not issued any new um, permits for for military equipment to israel and will not and will not and they've made that clear well before this motion that they would not be approving any of those of, of any new applications of, of, of for permit until we could be satisfied that each of those applications would meet the rigorous requirements of our ex existing export uh, permit regime. And, and, but, but we've also acknowledged that there, there were a number of permits that were previously issued. They'll be respected and we'll continue to proceed with that. And because, you know, I think there are, there would be significant implications for failing to do so, but they, those permits that were previously issued were, in the opinion of, of GAC, fully compliant with that rigorous regime to which I have referred. Right. And, and, and any future one will be judged in, in the context of making sure that it meets the requirements within that regime. Right. So, but if an order was on the books and it had met the export permit uh, standard when it was placed, yes. even if it's an arms, uh, military equipment, something the Israeli military can use, if it predates January 8th, it's allowed to leave the country and go to if, Israel. If the permit was issued, it, 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 will, it will remain in effect, if, but, but since January 8th, 
No new per permits yeah. have been issued, and, and frankly, no, no new per permits will be issued unless they, they satisfy the rigorous requirements of our export permit system. Okay, as you know, the reaction to this, just as a final point, is, has been controversial and divisive because it was seen as much more than what you are laying out uh, here with me now. We reached out to the government of Israel for their reaction. I spoke to uh, a foreign uh, policy advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu named Ophir Falk. Uh, he's going to be on the show uh, later uh, in, in, the, in this program. He called this vote by the Canadian Parliament a badge of shame and he compared uh, the sentiment expressed in the parliament this week to Canada's refusal to allow Jews into the country uh, during the Holocaust. What's your reaction to, he's a Canadian Israeli, what's your reaction to those comments from an advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu? Respectfully, I, I, I believe he's wrong. Um, that, that's a little hyperbolic and, and, in, and, and in fact, um, the position of, of, of Canada has been well articulated well before that resolution. We were calling for a humanitarian ceasefire. We have said that Israel had a right to defend itself. We have said that Hamas is a terrorist organization. And in calling for a ceasefire, we've gone further and also said, and it's in that resolution, that, that Hamas, because they're a terrorist organization, needed to lay down their arms and return all hostages. And, and we have reiterated a long-held uh, Canadian position that we support a, a negotiated two-state solution that would include security assurances for the state of Israel. And, and so, quite frankly, I, I would invite your, your, your commentator to, to go back and take a really good hard look at that, 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 the, the full text of that motion and compare it to existing long-held Canadian policy as it, as it pertains to a two-state solution and statements that we have made previously calling for humanitarian ceasefire. We are, quite frankly, very concerned about the, the impact that the hostilities are having on innocent civilian lives. And, and while we absolutely believe that Israel has a right to defend itself, that cannot uh, be, be at the cost of, of the loss of, of, of innocent civilian lives among the Palestinians. And, and so I, I think our position has been well articulated and clear. I think it's a principled position. And, and, and I would invite all Canadians to take a good hard look at, at where we've, what we've said and what we're doing. Defense Minister Bill Blair, thank you for your time today, sir. Thanks, David.